Hello and welcome to another episode of A Rough Sketch of History. Uh, this episode is Billy Yank and the Doughboy. And in this episode we are going to compare and contrast the experience of American soldiers in the American Civil War to the First World War to give a sense of uh, why this conflict was, was so radically different than anything in the American experience prior to this. Um, uh, the names involved here, the, the nicknames of the American soldier at the time. Uh, Billy Yank was the name of the, the nickname for Union soldiers during the war. And in First World War, uh, American soldiers, particularly uh, infantrymen, front, frontline fighters, were called doughboys. Um, and an interesting thing is nobody really knows why they were called doughboys, but um, both in Europe and back in the United States, that's what they were referred to in, in public and in the papers and by politicians. Um, there are a couple theories where this name came from. One of the theories was that the, the buttons on their jackets, the, the war actually predates zippers, so everything was closed up by buttons, uh, kind of looked like little dough cakes. Um, other people say that the name dates back to the uh, Mexican-American War when uh, they started calling uh, frontline infantry doughboys because uh, as they were marching around in the, the dry um, Mexican countryside, they'd get coated with dust and they would look somewhat like Baker's assistants coated with flour and Baker's assistants um, were called doughboys. Other people have guessed that this was a term that came from U.S. cavalry troopers is kind of a derisive term that uh, cavalry troopers, since they had a pack on a horse, ate a little bit better, and whereas uh, frontline slogging infantry had to rely on fried dough. Um, and in fact, I even read one case that says that they think the name floated around all the way back to the Revolutionary War, where soldiers would rub white clay into the piping of their uniforms to make it look a little brighter and when they would go marching in the rain if they got rained on the clay would turn into glob and slough off of them making them look like they were dripping with dough um, but regardless of the origin that's that's what they were called i think it's kind of funny that the um the british soldiers initially wanted to refer to them as sammies referring to uncle sam but i guess we wanted to come up with our own name and not be named by somebody else so that that didn't stick but um, every war has its, has its terms, um, especially in you know, larger scale conflicts. In the Civil War, uh, we had Billy Yank. In World War II, we called them GIs. Uh, in Vietnam, they were called grunts. And uh, World War I had, had its doughboys. So the, uh, the last major uh, war in the United States prior to the First World War was the American Civil War, which was only 53 years prior. Uh, so not a long time, not, not ancient history to them by any means. Um, the U.S. had fought in other wars since then, but nothing remotely on the scale of the Civil War or the uh, First World War. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, Spanish-American War, which happened in uh, 1898, the entire war lasted 10 weeks and there were single days um, in the Battle of the Meuse Argonne where there were more casualties in one day than in the entire Spanish-American War. Um, but uh, these inter-year wars, these wars between the Civil War and the First World War, had very little impact on the professional aspect of the military. As I said before, the United States had a very small military and the vast majority of doughboys had no military experience whatsoever. Um, and military professionals uh, have a hard enough time keeping up with, with change. Um, there's a saying that generals always fight the last war, they, in the sense that they, they always look to the last war to how they should fight the current war. And if it's hard for, for professionals where this is their job to understand these things to keep up the, uh, the typical layperson in the United States at this time, if they were have thought of a large-scale conflict, if they thought, well, what war would be like? In many ways, they would think back to the American Civil War uh, and that they had read about in magazines and books and heard stories from family members. Um, in fact, prior to uh, the First World War, U.S. officers still studied the Civil War uh, to understand tactics and maneuvers. That was what was taught at West Point. Um, again, because that was the most recent experience of a large-scale conflict of how armies 
um, acted and moved. But much had changed in the 50 plus years um, uh, between the American Civil War and the First World War. And, and uh, this war would look very different. And uh, to get a sense of this, let's look at the First World War Doughboy and compare him to the American Civil War's Billy Yank. So I've said this is a rough sketch of history. There's going to be a lot more sketching in this one. So we'll see how it goes. So uh, let's take a look at my stick figure drawings of these two individuals. So we have Billy Yank. He's got a little cap. And we have our doughboy. So, right off the bat, uh, we see a, a color difference is probably the most obvious. Um, in the American Civil War, ammunition created great plumes of smoke that lingered on the battlefield. So after just a few minutes of firing, the battlefield would become obscured with, with um, these great clouds. And having brightly colored uniforms helped reduce friendly fire and helped units identify each other on the battlefield. Also, in the American Civil War, you could uh, generally see the enemy a long while before you could actually shoot at them because of the range of the weapons. Um, so, that, so the Billy Yank would wear a, a bright blue uniform. By the time of the Doughboy, ammunition used what was called smokeless powder, which wasn't really completely smokeless, but the smoke it produced uh, was so thin that it wouldn't obscure vision even after heavy firing. And uh, not only that, it because it burned more completely, it could shoot bullets much farther. Um, so in World War I battlefields, uh, or First World War battlefields, didn't become obscure with smoke from gunfire. And if you were close enough to see someone, even at a distance, you were close enough to shoot at them or get shot at. So the advantage of having bright colors to prevent friendly fire was far outweighed by the danger of being spotted by the enemy. Um, the French learned this the hard way. Most armies had updated their uniforms by 1914, but the uh, French went to war with bright blue or bright red and blue, um, bright blue jackets and red pants, and uh, they had to switch to something less conspicuous after the first few months of the war, after suffering suffering terrible casualties. But the Doughboy wore an olive khaki color that was designed to blend in with the foliage of Europe, um, as you can also see that. Uh, Billy Yank wore a blue cap, and our doughboy wears a, a helmet. Um, the, the, uh, at the start of World War I, no armies wore metal helmets. Um, by the end, they all did. Doughboys wore a helmet of British design that was given the riveting name of Helmet M17. Um, so a little word of the wise, if you look at a piece of World War I equipment that the Americans had, its name is probably whatever it is, followed by M17. Um, for the purpose, uh, uh, the purpose of helmets was not to uh, stop bullets. That they couldn't do this. The purpose was to shield the head and neck uh, from shrapnel, usually coming down. That's why it was so broad, um, which was the biggest source of casualties and injuries on the uh, battlefield in World War One. Uh, Billy Yank uh, carried carried a, a musket or a, a rifled musket. So I'll try and draw a little picture here. Typically the Springfield model 1861. It was loaded uh, through the barrel and the bullet was uh, pushed down with a with a ramrod. This uh, took a considerable amount of time as each shot had to be loaded after it fired. And a well-trained soldier could fire about three rounds in a minute and could reasonably hit a target about 400 yards away. But realistically, most soldiers in the American Civil War um, 
just like most soldiers uh, in the First World War, were not particularly well trained. They often only received a few months or even weeks of training. Uh, typically, uh, Billy Yank could maintain a rate of fire of about two rounds a minute and only hit targets about 150 yards away. Now the Doughboy carried what's called a bolt action rifle, which from my sketch you're not going to see a radically different difference in it, but and uh, meaning that the ammunition was placed into the rifle um, by a little action, a little in the in the, the, the breech of the rifle, and it had a, a mechanism called a bolt, which uh, would be worked back and forth by hand, which after each time a uh, a shot was fired, the, the bolt would be pulled back, backward, ejecting the empty cartridge, then pulled forward, putting a new cartridge into place, uh, ready to be fired. This could be done very quickly, and a soldier could fire about 12 aimed rounds a minute at a range of about 1,200 yards. So consider compare that to only 150 yards. Though again, the average doughboy, though he could fire 12 shots in a minute, um, would probably have any trouble hitting things beyond 600 yards, uh, given his training and experience. Um, uh, to top it off, rifles in the First World War had a much higher uh, muzzle velocity than American Civil War muskets, uh, meaning the bullet, uh, I'll put, so the, to reiterate, the bullets would go in there as opposed to the surface. Uh, the bullet would uh, travel much faster leaving the barrel, meaning that it, um, it could travel in a straighter line to hit its target, so to sort of illustrate that in the Civil War, if you wanted to fire at a distance, you had to kind of arc the shot, whereas these later rifles could fire in a straight line and have the same distance achieved because there was a little drop off of the projectile. Um, this made it a much easier thing to use, uh, even if you had limited training. Um, so being able to calculate these sort of art shots was very difficult, especially in a combat situation. And uh, then again, uh, reiterating that even though technically a, a musketed or a um, rifled musket had a much farther range, uh, reasonably what a soldier could hit was, was only about 150 yards. Um, so to kind of draw a comparison here, um, oh, and other thing is that both sides both had and used bayonets, which essentially are a blade attached to the end of the barrel, or could be attached for close quarter fighting. Um, it essentially turned the rifle into a big spear, um, and there were times when um, that was necessary in both the Civil War and still into the First World War. Um, so the Doughboy has a rifle which can shoot about four times as far and about four times as fast. Um, so you can see a, a much, we're already shaping up a, a very different experience of what the battlefield is going to be looking like. Uh, an interesting side note is that the U.S. rifle, uh, the official U.S. rifle in the First World War was the uh, M1903 Springfield rifle. And it was a very fine rifle in all respects. Uh, it was used in the Army uh, through the Second World War, Korean War, and even into the Vietnam War, uh, particularly as a, as a long-distance sniper rifle. Uh, but at the start of the war, the United States had nowhere near as many of those rifles as they needed. Uh, but plenty of U.S. factories were making British uh, P-14 Enfield rifles and selling them to Great Britain. So they were being made in the United States and sold overseas. Uh, to save time and money, these rifle factories were just retooled to uh, the design to accept American ammunition and rechristened the U.S. Rifle M17. So again, interesting names. Um, this became by far the most commonly used rifle in the U.S. Army. So in the First World War, uh, oddly enough, the official U.S. rifle saw comparatively little use and most old boys carried a British-designed American-made rifle. Um, so uh, now let's talk a little bit about what was in the pack of the Doughboy and Billy Yank. So um, they both had emergency rations. 
uh, Billy Yank often would carry a uh, hardtack, which is kind of like a thick cracker. Um, it was hard to eat due to its lack of flavor and um, its texture, which was as hard as a rock. And they would also um, carry with them salted pork. And uh, these were uh, typically the types of things that they would have carried as, I guess we would consider emergency rations, though spoilage and pests getting into the food were always an issue. Now, uh, Billy Yank was better off, or not Billy, uh, the Doughboy was better off in the food department. Uh, he carried what were called iron rations because the food was sealed in metal cans. And uh, these cans contained a variety of items, so he would have, but they all would have just been basic cans. And um, typically in a combat situation, they would have carried items such as uh, they had an emergency ration, which was essentially beef bouillon mixed with wheat flour. Um, doesn't sound too appetizing. Uh, corned beef, cans of salmon, uh, small bars of chocolate, um, and uh, cans containing uh, crackers and packets of salt and pepper. Um, canning uh, the food in the First World War not only uh, helped keep it from spoiling and kept it pest free, but it also, um, if it was exposed to chemical attacks, the cans could be cleaned and the food inside was still edible, uh, which was a, a, a continuous concern and problem during the war. Um, tying in with the gas attack, you'll also notice that the uh, Doughboy is wearing his gas mask. Um, it was a canvas uh, bat or sack or covering a, um, a rubber or uh, airproof layer, rubberized layer. Uh, there was a hose that led down to a metal box, which was kept in a canvas pouch on the chest, uh, which allowed the air to be filtered in to... Um, uh, to be safe to breathe. Uh, wearing the gas mask was uncomfortable uh, and claustrophobic and uh, difficult breathing was very labored, but it was necessary for survival. So um, the gas masks were always something that soldiers would be uh, very keen not to lose. Um, going back to the food real quick, um, uh, both the Doughboy and Billy Yank ate a much wider variety of foods than this in field kitchens uh, farther away from the battle. But this is the kind of food they would have had in their packs in a combat situation. Now you might think that food would be the last thing on anybody's mind um, during a combat situation or in a battle. But unlike the Civil War, uh, where battles generally concluded at nightfall and at most lasted a day or two, a uh, battle going on for three or four days was would have been extremely long. But battles in the First World War would rage for 24 hours a day, sometimes for months at a time, and soldiers would often go days or even weeks without a hot meal. Um, so supporting Billy Yank and the Doughboy, both of them had a myriad of artillery pieces. Um, the most common ones for the... Uh, For Billy Yank was called the 12 pound Napoleon. Draw a cannon here. And for the uh, Doughboy, he had the The French 75. Oddly enough, as you can maybe guess by the names, they were both French designs. Now, the Napoleon was based on a cannon built for the army of Napoleon III, and the 75 millimeter was based on the French 75 um, millimeter field gun. Uh, interesting little side note, if you've ever heard of a cocktail called the French 75, it's actually named after this gun because it was a technological marvel in its day got a lot of press. Uh, the way these guns operated was radically different. Um, the Napoleon was a smooth bore weapon, meaning that the inside of the gun tube uh, was smooth, as opposed to a rifle barrel that had grooves, which the 75 had, which caused the projectile to spin, uh, stabilizing it as it left the barrel. The 12-pound uh, gun, as you might be able to guess, fired a 12-pound cannonball. Um, 
it was loaded by placing the round uh, in the barrel and uh, rammed down through to the end uh, in a similar way that the musket was loaded. Um, uh, and pushed down to a rod to the end of the barrel. Uh, then a fuse would be ignited, would ignite propellant, shooting the ball out of the cannon. Um, the uh, cannon could hit targets up to 1,500 yards away. Um, they typically fired a hollow cannonball, uh, known as a shell, uh, that was filled with 72 round metal balls and about uh, half a pound of black powder, more or less the same stuff you find in firecrackers today. Um, it was uh, the most uh, common use or was not to actually have it hit its targets, but to have a, a fuse, a timed fuse, um, that would cause it to explode midair over its target and uh, rip the cannonball open and the metal balls would fly out and, and uh, it could be deadly to uh, anyone standing within 30, year, or 30 yards of the, uh, of the detonation. Um, now something to keep in mind is that when this cannon fired, you had a lot of, you, the cannonball would go out, but you had a lot of force pushing the cannon back. And that's what would happen each time it would fire, it would buck and, and roll back and would have to be slid back into place each time. So technically the cannon could fire up to three rounds a minute, but in practice they never did. Um, uh, between having to re-aim the cannon, uh, between it kind of flying back, like that, the fact that you'd have to have crew members run up in the front of it um, to put the new ammunition in between each time. A good crew could get about two aim shots off in a minute, but manufacturing and transportation was not was much more limited in the American Civil War, so they didn't waste shots. They were very careful in, in how they aimed them, so typically a cannon like this would fire about one shot a minute. Now compare this to the Doughboys French 75. The uh, 75 as compared to a, a round cannibal, fired a, a bullet-shaped shell. And um, it was fired from the rifled barrel, which meant that it would spin to give it accuracy. Uh, the shell weighed about 14 to 16 pounds, depending on the type, and it was loaded through the breech. So similar to the bolt-action system, it would go into the, the rear. Um, and so that meant that all you had to do to fire it was to open up the back, slide in the shell, close it, and, uh, and fire the mechanism. Uh, this could be done very rapidly and could fire about 15 rounds in a minute, and they could maintain this pace as long as ammunition was sufficient. It could even fire up to 30 rounds a minute uh, for shorter periods, but you risk damaging the gun because the barrel would get so hot. Um, now, the 75 revolutionized modern artillery, um, and the biggest part here was this little tube down here on the bottom. Now remember how the Napoleon would roll back every time it was fired? The tube in this gun is the hydraulic mechanism. Uh, has oil and a spring in it, which would absorb the recoil of the gun. Um, so not only could the 75 fire at remarkable speeds, um, but it could do so effectively. Each time it fired, the gun would, would push back on this um, hydraulic, but it would stay in place. It would be aimed at the same position. It didn't have to be re-aimed each time. Um, it fired uh, two types of ammunition, uh, shrapnel ammunition and high explosive. Now, shrapnel was a, shells were essentially like a big shotgun. It fired out a shell that detonated and as opposed to the, the cannon, which, or the Napoleon, where the shell would explode in every direction, the shell would fire it all forward like a big shotgun blast. Uh, it was filled with about 250 lead balls and it had a fuse that would detonate at a determined time and, and rain down these shells at a specific target. At the start of the war, this was the main type of artillery shell used by all most armies in the field gun, which is what these would be called, field guns. Um, by the time the Americans entered the war, this had become less common because they found the, these types of shells were not um, effective against troops in trenches or fortified positions. Now, a high-explosive shell, or an HE shell, in military terms, uh, became much more common. These are essentially just metal cases filled with high explosive. Um, in this case, a substance called uh, melianite. Uh, a high explosive sh shell carried about 30 ounces of melianite, um, which carried an explosive force of about four sticks of dynamite. 
Uh, the shockwave from this kind of a weapon could be fatal if it exploded nearby, but the bigger danger was the metal casing around uh, which would shatter into hundreds and hundreds of shards. Uh, when these shells detonated, it would be lethal, or could be lethal, to anyone standing 150 yards away from the detonation. Uh, these shells could be mounted with fuses that um, were set for a certain amount of time uh, to explode in the air and rain down in fragments, or they could be set as with contact fuses, um, even could, they could even be put on a delay so they could explode as soon as they hit the ground, or the shell could be designed to burrow into a trench or a structure and then explode, uh, making it very hard to find protection from these kinds of shells. Um, the 75 uh, could fire shrapnel shells about 740 yards, whereas the HE shells, more common by the time the Americans were in the war, uh, could fire about 9,300 yards away. So <clears throat> that's five miles. Um, the jump in artillery technology from the American Civil War to the uh, First World War was frightening. Uh, let's compare what a battery, that's the name of a group of artillery pieces, of four guns from Billy Yank and, um, and the Doughboys. In one minute, a team of the Doughboys could fire 120 shots. Uh, Billy Yank's team could fire eight. The 75's volleys uh, would generate... 68 times as much explosive force, um, which is very important when you're trying to knock down buildings or structures. And the, um, but the biggest comparison is, is the effect it could have over a wide area. And the the uh, Civil War battery could cover an area about 800 square yards in a minute with deadly shrapnel, whereas a 75 could cover about 4,000 square yards. Um, now, to give a sense of, of how much more destructive this weapon was than this weapon, in the American Civil War, about 5% of all of the combat casualties in the war resulted from uh, artillery fire. In the First World War, that number was 70%. So this is a, a huge jump. Um, so in the First World War was an artillery war, and all of the generals and all of the soldiers had no real historical comparison or tactics or training at the onset of the war to deal with this. Um, the soldiers were not prepared for what a modern war would be like. And the, um, so when there was a lot of the, the catastrophic, I guess what you would see, think of as tactical mistakes or errors that led in, into much of the the huge casualties early in the war, it's because nobody had ever dealt with this number before. And they essentially had to learn as they go, and the, the penalty for mistakes um, was lives. Now, to also kind of give a sense of other things that were dramatically different in this war, that uh, the Doughboy carried a lot of things into battle that the uh, that, that Billy Yank uh, did not, things that uh, he would have had little to no concept of. And one of those things he would have been somewhat aware of was the hand grenade. It's a poor drawing of one, but I'm sure if any, any of you have seen a movie, you know what a hand grenade looks like, an action movie. Um, now, the Civil War, they did have items kind of like a hand grenade, but they didn't see much use, um, and they were somewhat rare. Uh, they were very widespread in the First World War. Um, the boys carried what was known as the Mark I and then later the Mark II hand grenade, which were based on a French grenade design known as the F1. And um, essentially it's just a small bomb with a fuse that uh, when you pull a pin and release the handle, it explodes in about four or five seconds. And a grenade has about two ounces of explosives um, and it weighed about a pound. And the, again, like the artillery shells, the danger of a grenade was not generally the explosion, but the fragments of metal um, that the explosion would shoot out in every direction. Uh, it was a key weapon uh, for the Americans and for all the sites in the First World War, as it was often fought at very close range in trenches and dugouts and places where a rifle wasn't much use. The uh, Mark II grenade of the First World War was also the grenade used in the Second World War and was used up into the Korean War. It wasn't until Vietnam that the United States started to adopt a new design. Uh, another difference, a uh, major difference between 
really yanking the doughboy was the use of machine guns. Now, the American Civil War did have rapid-fire weapons, but these were rare and didn't have much of an impact, um, whereas machine guns were one of the defining weapons along with artillery like this in the First World War. Um, most uh, doughboys used the French Hotkiss M14 machine gun, which looked somewhat like this. See there, but there. Rather than, um, at the start of the war, the United States had very few machine guns, but it, it bought um, thousands of these from the French, the, the Hotchkiss, which was the, the main French design. Um, as the war progressed, they started to use uh, American designed machine guns uh, and transitioned to the M1917 Browning, which looked a little bit like this. Oops explain some of the differences here in a second, because they are actually quite substantial. Now, each gun worked a little bit different in the mechanisms, but the idea is basically the same behind all machine guns. Um, remember when I talked about the bolt action rifle? Um, well, this is essentially the same concept, except that the, the mechanism, the machine of the gun uses the force of the propellant and the recoil um, to essentially work the bolt instead of it doing by hand. Um, this allowed that as soon as you fired one shot, the gun automatically cleared it and reloaded it for another shot. Um, now this, uh, this could happen in a fraction of a, cent a second and both the, um, both the Hotchkiss and the Browning could fire about 500 rounds in a minute. So, I mean, think about that, 500 rounds in, in 60 seconds. Uh, the advantage of the Hotchkiss was that it was air-cooled. That's, they called them donuts. There were these metal rings in the front that helped dissipate the heat. Uh, it had a heavy barrel uh, that would actually start to glow a, a dark red color when it got hot enough from so many shells being fired. Um, and the, the discs would dissipate the heat to keep it from warping the barrel. And if the barrel got too hot, it could actually quickly, with kind of heat insulated mittens be unscrewed and a new one could be screwed on while it cooled. Uh, it was lighter than the heavier American design, but it still weighed 80 pounds with the tripod that it was mounted on. So it wasn't something that anyone was carrying around. It had to be fixed in one position. Uh, the Browning weighed about a hundred, over a hundred pounds, but it had uh, what was called a water, uh, a water jacket. So the barrel here is wrapped in a thing that's, that's filled with, with water. And as the uh, barrel would heat up, the water would boil and turn into steam and then come back into a little collection tank. Um, and uh, this would keep the barrel cool. And then as this uh, would evaporate out, they could just pour more water into this. Um, uh, both uh, these, again, were heavy guns and uh, they uh, actually both worked rather well. Um, occasionally a, a, a round would jam, so think of the same way like a copy machine jams. Occasionally a bullet would get stuck in this in this cycle of going off and bringing a new bullet into the system. Um, but this could be quickly uh, cleared by the crews, and both of these weapons were able to fire uh, literally for hours, with rarely pausing um, as long as ammunition and supplies held up. Held up. And, my next video, I'll go over a little bit more about how machine guns were used, uh, but the short answer to give you a sense of understanding was that these guns were usually manned by a team of two or to four soldiers, and they could, so one machine gun had about two to four soldiers in it, and it could put out about as much fire as 50 riflemen. So again, to give you a sense of the devastation that a small group of people could bring to bear. Um, again, this was particularly devastating at the beginning of the war when soldiers were not trained on how to deal with them. And sadly, when the Doughboy went to war, they were very dismissive of a lot of the lessons that the French and British tried to pass on to them and had to learn these lessons uh, the painful way themselves. Uh, sadly, um, resulting in thousands of deaths and injuries that... Um, as this learning process proceeded. Uh, now, 
some of the other weapons that were carried into battle um, were light automatic weapons. Now, these were new inventions. They didn't even exist at the start of the war. They were developed during the war. Um, one was known as the, uh, the Shosha, which is a French word, because again, French design. And um, this is kind of what it looked like. And um, the Shosha was a, was a finicky weapon. It had a tendency to jam, as I talked before, um, and break if it wasn't kept clean, something that was hard to do on a, on a uh, World War I battlefield. Um, it also kind of fell into a, an unpleasant sort of middle ground. It, it, it fired much faster um, than, uh, than a rifle. It held 20 rounds in this moon-shaped um, magazine. And it could fire all of these rounds off in about five seconds. So realistically, it would have been fired in bursts or single shots at a time. Um, but uh, it had the problem of that it, it fired too slow to really work as a machine gun, but too fast and too heavy to work as a rifle. Uh, as I said, it would jam a lot. Um, and it was very unpopular with, with the doughboys. And often doughboys would lose their show shots, or as they often called them, show shows at the first opportunity. Um, a big problem with these was actually manufacturing quality control. If a soldier got one that, that worked well, they tended to work all right, but uh, so many of them were problematic straight out of the factory that um, the soldiers uh, strongly disliked these weapons. The much more popular, the less common weapon, uh, because again, anything that was American made uh, took time to get to the field where French stuff was ready to go, was the uh, with the Browning automatic rifle, which served with quite a bit of distinction in the Second World War as well. And again, it, it carried a 20 round magazine, uh, but it could be fired off in about three seconds. Though again, it tended to fire in bursts or like a semi-automatic rifle. And um, the soldiers liked this quite well. It was a rugged, reliable weapon. Um, it allowed one soldier to kind of fill that niche to function as a like a machine gun on the go uh, when they couldn't carry these much more heavier ones um, as the front lines moved forward. Um, it would remain in uh, use in the U.S. Army until the Vietnam era and uh, has quite a history behind it. Um, now again, the, uh, the idea of both of these weapons was, was sort of a, a mini marching machine gun uh, that could keep up with the troops as they moved forward. It, could be fired from the hip while standing, but that didn't work too well. It was best used when propped up with a bipod uh, and fired from a, from a prone position lying down. Um, let's see, and these were kind of the, the basic, again, there were many, many weapons used in the First World War and also in the American Civil War, but these were more the, the common ones that uh, would be most often seen. Um, some other things that uh, the Doughboy had experience with that would have been uh, completely unimaginable to the French, or not to the French, to the um, to Bill Yank in the uh, Civil War was were planes and tanks. Now the the Doughboy had a variety, of, flew a variety of planes, but they were mostly biplanes. I can try of all the things I tried to draw. This is the one I have the hardest time with. And none of these drawings are very good, but you get the idea. So they were biplanes in the sense that they had two wings. And um, planes were used differently in the First World War than what you might think today. They were primarily used as reconnaissance planes, as scouts. Um, the enemy would, uh, or that they would, they would use to scout enemy positions, and they could relay those positions to the artillery on the ground using a wireless telegraph and Morse code. Um, to counteract this, um, both sides would then employ fighter planes to try to shoot down the reconnaissance planes. And uh, later in the war, they did um, start implementing bombers, uh, nothing quite as heavy as what we'd understand today, but planes that could carry some small amount of bombs. And uh, fighter planes would also engage what was called strafing, which is where there would be a machine gun mounted on the gun. They had a system that allowed it to shoot through a propeller that it was synced up with the propeller so the bullets wouldn't hit it. And the plane would dive down 
and shoot at troops on the ground and pull away before they could react. Um, in addition to planes, another thing that was often used were actually balloons that uh, I don't envy these these soldiers, but they were put in balloons and hung high over the battlefield with binoculars to relay um, positions. These could often be more effective than planes because they would actually wire a, a cord all the way up to them and they could talk over the telephone. Um, again, this also plays into why this number was so high, uh, the artillery number, because planes uh, were able to help artillery zone in to exact points. Um, they did tactics by or different systems by relaying messages. Uh, they would also do an interesting system where they would drop flares of different colors, and they would do that to indicate distances. So a plane would be flying over the enemy, or flying over your artillery and drop a, a blue or a white flare, and then um, they would travel for five minutes at 100 miles an hour and drop a green flare, and then five minutes at 100 miles an hour, and the artillery could use where these were landing to calculate um, using mathematics uh, exactly where they wanted their shells to go. Um, again, like I said, they also um, uh, used tanks. Ameri Americans predominantly used uh, a French tank that looked somewhat like this. Um, it was called the uh, Renault 17 or the FT 17. Um, it was had a crew of two. You had a, a driver or a commander and a gunner standing up there, and a driver who was kind of laying back this way. This was inside the tank, of course. Um, the tank's turret had a um, mounted a machine gun or a small cannon. Um, inside these tanks, it was loud. It was dark and the commander communicated with his driver uh, by kicking him. So he would kick with his right foot to turn right, kick with his left foot to turn left. Uh, being kicked with both feet meant to go straight, and being kicked in the, the center of the, or no, I, I, being kicked in the center of the back was to uh, back up or stop, and to be kicked with both feet was to go forward. And if you were getting a flurry of rapid kicks, it meant to turn around and get out of there as fast as possible. Um, I imagine that as the war went on, most drivers didn't get along with their commanders after a couple of days, but I don't know about that one way or the other. Um, so this is kind of the, the basic covering of it, um, but these were, were the, the basic weapons uh, used during the war, and contrasting them with the uh, Civil War experience, I guess I'm hoping to show that, that the uh, battlefield was much more complex for the Doughboy than it was for um, for Billy Yank. Um, there were a greater number of weapons systems to interact with each other, greater number of threats. It's important to remember that all of these weapons here that the Doughboy had, the uh, Germans had their own versions of um, that worked just as well, if not in some cases even better. Um, he had to be prepared to fight for days or even weeks without rest. Um, as opposed to, as I said, Billy Yank were usually fighting stop when the sun went down. Um, now, when I make these comparisons, it's, it's not there to say that the Doughboy's experience was worse than Billy Yank's experience. I don't think you can really uh, compare these things. Uh, but I think the point to draw here is that um, this battlefield for the Doughboy was, was a radically different place than his grandfather in the American Civil War. Um, so not only did the generals, but the frontline soldier just had no basis of comparison to understand what they were getting into. And, and being introduced into the war was a shock. Um, not only were the, the Americans tactically and, and from a just professional military aspect uh, had a hard time adapting, you also just have a psychological impact of, of war being nothing like, war can never really be understood anyway if one has not been in it but to have zero frame of reference to what to expect uh, to make things worse um, that was one advantage of during the civil war is that uh, billy yank fought against johnny reb and they both were in the same boat they both were starting this war they had no ground they, they were both learning as they went but the german soldier as they called themselves their their doughboy equivalent which is actually not as polite they were called frontschlein <laughs> 
or front pigs, um, they had been doing this for three years. They un understood it well, um, and they would be uh, a terrible uh, foe to go up against. And uh, in my next video, I want to uh, cover a little bit about uh, what warfare was like on the Western Front and kind of what the doughboy would be facing uh, when he uh, entered into the Argonne Forest at the um, Battle of Meuse-Argonne. Uh, thank you for your time. Bye.